Good morning, everybody. I would like to first thank the organizers for having included me in this conference, which really means a great deal to me, even though I was not a George Mossy student. But I first met George Mossy at the Madison Workshop of 1975, when we both gave lectures on the workshop's theme, Geschichte im Gegenwartsdrama. My paper looked back at the various forms and strategies post-war German drama had adopted since 1945 to deal with the Nazi period and the Holocaust, the absurd theater, the Brechtian parable, and the documentary play. George's topic was the NS Kampfbühne, and just as the crisis of German ideology of 1964 had analyzed the 19th century genealogy of fascist culture, George emphasized the deep roots of the Nazi propaganda theater in the 19th century Vereinsbühnen and in the tradition of the German national theater. Similarly, when we try to explain the rise of right-wing movements in the US today, and the simultaneous disembowelment of democratic values and institutions, we must look at the larger time frame. But we must not only consider the manifestations of American fascism in the 1930s and 40s and earlier, some of which were cogently analyzed at the time in the work of Löwenthal, Gutermann, Adorno and others, and the resurfacing of fascist tropes and images since the 1990s on the radical fringe of American politics. We must also ask to what extent neoliberalism's decades-long war on public goods and on the structure of subjectivity, its promotion of human capital, self-investment, the qualified self, and so forth, how all of that has prepared the ground for the current upsurge of anger, protest, and despair. The ever-increasing penetration of life worlds by the rules of monetization together with the unchecked power of the social media behemoths, is a direct threat to the public sphere of democratic societies. Rather than embracing, though, facile analogies of interwar fascism and the present, I want to examine some of the categories used to describe interwar fascism and national socialism and explore their continuing relevance and simultaneous obsolescence in today's context. In a variation of what Adorno once said about nationalism in the late 50s, I would suggest that fascism is both obsolete and up-to-date today. No question that right-wing fringe phenomena have been normalized under Trump, more spectacularly when he claimed that there were good people on both sides in the Charlottesville riots. What used to be called the lunatic, lunatic fringe in American politics is being made respectable by such pronouncements and by the euphemism of the alt-right itself. Adorno also warned that the afterlife of fascist tendencies within democracy is more dangerous than the afterlife of fascist tendencies against democracy. Today, we face a situation where Adorno's distinction has been cashed in. Tendencies from within, brilliantly analyzed by Wendy Brown in her recent book, Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution, emerged, emerging in the US with outright tendencies against democracy. The Trump regime participates in both. Just think of the Republican systematic attacks on voting rights, or compare Mark Zuckerberg's motto, quote, move fast and break things, unless you're breaking things, you're not moving fast enough, end quote, with Trump's daily practice of attacking and dismantling American governmental institutions, a practice which is fully in sync with Steve Bannon's demand to deconstruct the administrative state and with Breitbart's call to attack the Democrat media complex online. Trump uses Twitter and his fake, fake news mantra to gaslight the electorate while much of the de real deconstruction of governmental institutions regarding the law, healthcare, the environment, housing, foreign policy, climate, rarely catches the headlines in any sustained fashion. But it is Charlottesville and the zombie fascism of a long festering white supremacist right that makes it unavoidable to talk about fascism today. At the same time, it is clear that comparing Trump to Hitler or Mussolini amounts to nothing so much 
as a helpless anti-fascism, a mirror image of what it opposes. The careless use of the fascism analogy may also suggest to many Americans that fascism is an import from Europe rather than being indigenous to American politics. Hitler, after all, considered Madison Grant's 1916 book, The Passing of the Great Race, as his Bible. And the 1935 German race laws took American race legislation as their model. Fascism was always already transnational, just as it is today in Europe and beyond. We may have entered the era of the great forgetting. There's another reason for me, though, to think back to the mid-1970s. NGC was engaged in working through theories of fascism, best represented, perhaps, in Andy Rabenbach's incisive essay towards a Marxist theory of fascism and national socialism, and in the centrality of the journal, the centrality the journal attributed to Ernst Bloch's concept of Ungleichzeitigkeit, non-synchronicity, as a key element for our understanding of fascism as social movement and cultural synthesis. That work was obviously influenced by George's fascism studies, which we used and extended to, to other areas. It seems evident that cultural synthesis, not as homogenization, but as a bundling of contradictory dimensions, is at stake with the various layers of the conservative movement and its diverse electorate in the United States today. What used to be called the culture war in the 90s, waged by the neocons already since the 1980s, has morphed into an ever more radical cultural self-understanding of the alt-right, for whom the neocons are merely cuckservatives, cuckold conservatives in other words, not content to attack the influence of Heidegger or Derrida in the academy the old right has constructed another bogeyman called cultural Marxism, held to be responsible for the betrayal of American values and equated with political correctness. It is neither the primacy of politics, as in Nazism, nor the primacy of economics, as in traditional Marxism, that holds sway today. It is the primacy of culture that is mobilized by the old right And here's a quote from a recent volume of essays entitled A Fair Hearing, 2018. It offers a self-description of the old right as, quote, foremost an intellectual movement, end quote, whose main goal is, quote, to offer meaningful resistance and finally rout the left. In his introduction, the editor, George T. Shaw, makes no bones about the movement's targets, and I quote, Diversity and multiculturalism tend to make white societies poorer, more dangerous, and finally unlivable for whites. And white genocide is on the way because cultural manipulations such as state, academic, and media, promotion of feminism, diversity, promiscuity, and homo and transsexuality heavily suppress white birth rates." End quote. Clearly, this is the contemporary version of a cultural synthesis. But is it based on some objective non-synchronicity in Ernst Bloch's sense? Bloch's Ungleichzeitigkeit was able to analyze the force of so-called irrational or mythic imaginaries in segments of the German populace, such as peasants and the lower middle class, whose life experiences had not caught up with the pace of metropolitan modernity and cultural change. It focused on divergent temporalities of experience pervading social strata, which were susceptible to slogans of Führer, charisma, blut and boden, hostility to urban modernity, anti-Semitism, racial superiority, and Völkisch ideology. A mark of difference between then and today may be that such objective non-synchronicity may not even exist any longer in 21st century America. Different real-life temporal experiences have long since been ground down by the homogenization of life worlds achieved by the mass media and the force of capital. There is, of course, a political gap between red and blue states in the US, between rural areas and the urban centers. But such very real economic and social differences 
are culturally recoded to create a kind of artificial non-synchronicity between a corrupt present dominated by liberal urban elites and a more authentic past. This worldview captured in Trump's promise to drain the Washington swamp is nourished 24 seven with propaganda by Fox News, Sinclair Broadcasting and the Murdoch Papers. But the main outlets for the revival of tropes and images of interwar fascism, which has, called, which has itself become ungleichzeitig, are digital platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Reddit, Discount, HN, and so forth and so on. A bit more on that later. Now many other differences with interwar fascism are just too obvious. Contrary to Hitler or Mussolini, Trump does not have a future-oriented utopian vision. He is not the great charismatic leader unifying the nation through a mass movement. Trump speaks only to his base rather than to the nation as a whole. He plays at strongman at his rallies, whipping up the crowds, but simultaneously he claims to be a victim of the deep state, just as the alt-right claims to be victimized by liberal censorship of free speech. Of course, the Nazis also played the victim card, but it was counterbalanced by an ideologically seductive vision for a German future. And George has given great testimony to his experience as a Nazi rally, which we heard yesterday. But Make America Great Again is at best a Schwundstufe, a vestige of such a vision. That's the difference between the grandiose Nazi spectacles and a baseball cap. Much has been made of the real purchase of this deliberately amorphous appeal to another America, which encompasses a vast array of memories, fantasies, and dreams. Not just the good times of post-World War II high wages and full employment, but also the Confederacy and decades of Jim Crow laws. Not just the victory over fascism in World War II, but also the romanticizing of indigenous forms of American fascism which never gained power. Past glory and seamy dreams of white supremacy are the two sides of the explosive mix that fires up his followers at his rallies. It is difficult to imagine anybody believing that MAGA is possible. As a simulacrum of desire after loss, however, this slogan has proven quite powerful. The less it seems able to command reality, the more it needs an image of a powerful enemy that prevents America from being made great again. Which brings me back to the alt rights bogeyman of cultural Marxism. Two years ago, after the election of Trump and with Steve Bannon in the White House, I stumbled upon the role of the Frankfurt School as bête noire in American White, House, in, in American white nationalist discourse. The idea did not orig originate with Andrew Breitbart, but he was its great amplifier on the internet and in social media. And here's Breitbart himself, quote, critical theory was exactly the material we were taught at Tulane. It was quite literally a theory of criticizing everyone and everything everywhere. It was an attempt to tear down the social fabric by using all the social sciences. It was an infinite and unending criticism of the status quo, adolescent, adolescent rebellion against all established rules and norms. The real idea behind all of this was to make society totally unworkable by making everything basically meaningless." End quote. The term adolescent rebellion is odd here. None of the critical theorists were exactly adolescents when they developed their work. The American reception, however, is fundamentally linked to the youth rebellion of the 1960s, an obsession of Breitbart and Bannon, who blamed the 60s generation for the decline of America in his docufiction film, Generation X. In that Bannon film, the 60s generation is held responsible both for cultural Marxism in the academy and for the banking crisis of 2008, variant of another zombie-like pattern from earlier times, Bolsheviks and bankers. The obsession with the baby boomers points back to the Clinton years when another influential right-wing author, William S. Lind, gave a in very influential speech 
about the origins of political correctness. This was already in 2000. At a meeting of Accuracy in Academia, an organization that always coupled communism with liberalism in order to better attack the latter. To Lindt, political correctness is, quote, Marxism translated from economic into cultural terms, end quote. The superficial and distorted focus of his many speeches and articles were Lukács, Gramsci, Marcuse, and the Frankfurt School. The generalized attack on the baby boomers has been a conservative cliche for many years, of course, but its outright weaponization is meant to play well with subsequent generations, especially the millennials and Generation Z. I have written elsewhere about this strange right-wing obsession with the Frankfurt School and cultural Marxism. Of course, the Frankfurt School was a welcome code name on the right for Jewish influence at a time when open anti-Semitism was still mostly shunned in the US. But there also is a deeper dimension. There is an elective affinity to a perverted understanding of critical theory as grave digger of American democracy. Looking into the mirror of critical theory and its analysis of race hatred and media domination, Lindt, Breitbart, Bannon and their likes could recognize themselves and their own history. Their over-the-top attack on the Frankfurt School points to the fact that they themselves were doing what they falsely accused their opponents of doing, subverting American politics and culture. For what is the difference between making society unworkable and destroying the administrative state? Between making everything meaningless and creating alternative facts through fake news grounded in conspiracy theories? Adorno and Horkheimer have analyzed such processes of mimesis, projection, and inversion in their dialectic of enlightenment. Leo Löwenthal and Norbert Gutermann put it quite succinctly in their 1949 book about fascist tendencies in the US, the book entitled Prophets of Deceit. The follow of right-wing ideology, they say there, is nothing but the inverted reflection of the enemy. In the same way, the alt-right has adapted strategies of left-wing critique and turned them against the left. Anti-racism as proof that the left is racist toward whites. The alleged insurgency of cultural Marxism, thus the argument, must then be confronted by a counter-insurgency from the right. This is what Schmittian friend-foe thinking produces in the real world, a veritable hall of mirrors. In 2016, it was quite tempting to me to see Trump as a re-embodiment of Löwenthal and Gutermann's description of the fascist agitator. And here's a quote from that book. The agitator's statements are often ambiguous and unserious. It is difficult to pin him down to anything, and he gives the impression that he's deliberately play-acting. Moving in a twilight zone between the respectable and the forbidden, he is ready to use any device from jokes to double talk to wild extravagances." End quote. As Alec Ross put it in his December 2016 piece in The New Yorker, the Frankfurt School knew Trump was coming. At the same time, Adorno's notion of the authoritarian personality seems less persuasive today. Historical differences make the notion problematic <clears throat> for our time. Sure, there will always be the Archie Bunkers of the world, many of whom belong to Trump's base. But even if this psychological type was once predominant in society, it no longer is. Conventional middle-class values no longer enjoy unquestioned legitimacy, as they may have done in the 40s and 50s. Nor do sexual repression and authoritarian submission count among privileged forms of behavior. We must recognize the anti-authoritarianism and anti-conformism of the radical right, which is directed at democracy itself and goes perfectly together with admiration for the great leader, a strong man and disruptive force. The mode of operation of the fascist agitator, I would add, have, has also changed. Fundamental differences have emerged regarding the followers' relationship to authority and to our agitator president. While certain analogies between now and the interwar period cannot be denied, the whole structure of agitation 
And the narcissistic identification with the Führer as ego ideal, as Adorno had it, has changed in the age of, di of digital media, as have educa educational practices that used to be key to creating the authoritarian personality. Blind submission to authority is clearly not in tune with a neoliberal focus on creativity and self-investment. And when the agitator-in-chief uses Twitter not to articulate a coherent vision of the future, but rather presents himself as victim of a deep state, cabal, and America as victim of global economic wrongdoing and exploitation by other nations, he plays on his followers' sense of being disenfranchised and betrayed. But the followers themselves are no longer just the passive consumers of radio speeches, as in the 40s. They have become themselves agents on social media platforms. The older one-way top-down communication between leader and the masses has been replaced by a multi-directional communication and agency in the anonymity of group chat networking. Anonymity in digital public space, a key ingredient of Facebook's business model, is one of the main reasons for the alt-right success in normalizing and spreading hate speech, and also in organizing. The new role of agency changes the relationship between chief agitator and followers in yet another way. The chief agitator can limit himself to racist, misogynist, and attack dog whistles, which his followers then will amplify on digital platforms. Dog whistles point to an efficient practice of maintaining control and inciting action, that of not giving explicit orders, but of insinuating what should be done, a practice we know was prevalent among American mobsters. The congressional hearings of Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohn, have given new life to another formally discredited characterization of fascism in action, which Adorno and Horkheimer had developed, that of racketeering. As the multiple indictments of people in Trump's closest circle show, political and economic racketeering have merged, and they are intimately linked to a persistent attack on the law, something no mobster but a president can evidently get away with. Discursive racketeering, which it is, describes the link between Trump and his base, including the alt-right. Dominant in the spread of radical right-wing ideas and the mobilization for events like Charlottesville has been a series of platforms like YouTube, Discord, Reddit, HN, and others, including Facebook and Twitter, of course. The expansion from mere websites to interactive platforms in recent years has vastly increased the reach of alt-right ideology into the mainstream. There are large differences in the rhetoric of such platforms. Some are dedicated to recruiting followers with seemingly mainstream discussions. Some make use of the privileged status of memory in our culture and call for the protection of the Southern Confederate heritage. Others focus on alleged violation of free speech. Calls for violence, on the other hand, take place in private groups on discourse or Facebook. Tara McPherson, a media researcher from USC, has recently argued that these interactive platforms produce a new era of racial formation, an emergent structure of feeling, in Raymond Williams's word, a structure of feeling she calls immersive racism. The very immersive design of platforms helps the alt-right by encouraging anonymous comments on postings, trolling, and the proliferation of fake news. Hate speech is not a bug in the platform, but a generative feature of the business model and the algorithms that run these overlapping platforms which have provided an infrastructure that reaches millions. Let me conclude with another quote from, the Frank from a Frankfurt School of Source. Quote, Trumpism has no political or social theory. It has no philosophy and no concern for the truth. In a given situation, it will accept any theory that might prove useful and it will abandon that theory as soon as the situation changes. Trumpism is, Trumpism is both capitalistic and anti-capitalistic. It is authoritarian and anti-authoritarian. It will cooperate with any group that is amenable to Trumpist propaganda, but it will not hesitate to flatter authoritarian movements when that is more expedi expedient. Such versatility 
is unattainable in a democracy, end quote. This quote is from Franz Neumann's 1944 book, Behemoth, The Structure and Practice of National Socialism. Except where I say Trumpism, the original has National Socialism. In Behemoth, Neumann analyzed the Nazi regime's unprecedented assault on the law and on the state. Quote, nothing remains but profit, power, prestige, and above all fear. Devoid of any loyalty and concerned solely with the preservation of their own interests, the ruling groups will break apart as soon as the miracle-producing leader meets a worthy opponent, end quote. We're not quite at that stage yet. Adam Tooze, historian of the Third Reich's economy and of the recent 2008 crash, has argued that Neumann's insights are quite germane today. And I quote from Tooze, referring to Neumann, that there is no natural harmony between developed capitalism and legal, political, and social order, that modern, modern capitalism is fundamentally a fundamentally disruptive force that constantly challenges the rule of law as such. End quote. Read this together with a warning by David Frum, a conservative political commentator and author of the book Trumpocracy, the Corruption of the American Republic. Quote, and I close with that, if conservatives become convinced that they cannot win democratically, they will not abandon conservatism. They will reject democracy. Thank you. Thank you.